Welcome everyone, this is the Liberty Classroom course, History of Economic Thought 1, Classical Economics and the Marginal Revolution. I am your instructor, Robert Murphy, and we're now on Lecture 19, Friedrich von Wieser. These Austrians have such fun names to pronounce. So Wieser is 1851 to 1926. Some biographical remarks. He was born in Vienna, so again, literally an Austrian economist, and along with Bumbavirk, uh, Beezer was Menger's, let's call him, disciple. Right? It's uh, not that they sat in and received a bunch of course instruction from Menger, but both Bumbavirk and Beezer were the two that read Menger's principles book and uh, really just did a lot to extend those principles to the community of economists at large. So Wieser studied law at the University of Vienna. He entered the civil service in 1872. Later, he went on to study with the older historical school. So that's a type of a, uh, economic school of thought. And then he took over Menger's chair at the University of Vienna in 1903. So again, when Menger retired, it was Wieser who immediately filled that post. And while he was there, he had people enrolling in his class that you would recognize some of their names, uh, for example, Friedrich Hayek and Joseph Schumpeter. Wieser was the first to use the phrase marginal utility. So he was writing in German, of course, but in terms of uh, just putting those uh, words together in order to denote what we now mean by, of course, marginal utility, we've retained that phrase, whereas the usages that uh, Manger and Jevons and while Ross employed, because we remember they're credited with actually discovering the principle of marginal utility, or at least really bringing it to the attention of economists, they didn't actually use the phrase marginal utility in doing so. So Wieser, we could say he studied the intersection of pure economic theory, history, and sociology. And just to be clear, he did favor a heavily interventionist state. All right? So Wieser, in contrast to a lot of the early Austrian school economists, was by no means an advocate of laissez-faire. And you could actually point to him then as a counterexample if somebody says, oh, oh Austrian economics, that's just some thinly disguised uh, apologia for people who come in with just their, their laissez-faire views and they want to give this veneer of science to it. Well, no, Wieser totally endorsed Menger's economics in terms of how do you analyze market, the operation of a market economy, how does a market work, but Wieser thought we don't need to accept the outcomes produced from a laissez-faire economy. The, the state has a role to come in and try to improve upon them. So some of Wieser's important works... On the Origin and the Principal Laws of Economic Value, that's 1884. Natural Value, that's 1889. And Social Economics, 1914. So as I said, uh, both Bumbavirk and Wieser, they viewed themselves as just extending this new framework that Karl Menger basically invented from scratch. Obviously, in intellectual history, no human being is completely autonomous and invents things completely <laughs> with no influence, but as we said, other historians of economic thought even acknowledge that Karl Menger really developed his system, that he was, you know, he was nobody's pupil. So uh, Wieser, what he was doing is wanted to um, extend the Mengerian framework and really elaborate on how is it that f producer goods are priced in a market. So Menger had that hierarchy. Remember, we talked about this, that the lowest order, first order goods were the consumer goods, the ones that directly satisfied human wants. And then you had the second order goods, which were the factors of production that you would combine in order to produce first order goods. All right, so if, uh, if you don't like being out in the elements, it's cold, it's rainy, what have you, you want to have a, a house, so a house would be a first-order consumer good, a very durable one, of course, but it's directly satisfying your your wants, your your desires to be out of the cold and so on, get out of the elements. A hammer is very useful for building a house, 
but by itself, a hammer doesn't directly satisfy your wants. All right? It's not that, oh, man, it's going to rain. Let me get this hammer and cover my head with it. But because a house is very valuable, that's why a hammer and nails and things like that are valuable. They're, they're deriving their value from the, the flow, let's say, upward from the consumer goods. So Menger had uh, had this framework, and he understood that causal flow. And remember, that was the opposite of the way the classical economists talked. The classical economists, whether they said it explicitly or just implied it, led you to think that value, the source of value, was the, the factors of production, in particular labor, and then that was sort of transmitted and flowed into the consumer goods. Just the way they talked, their determination of price, for example, long-run price would had to focus on the cost of production, and that would pin down what the final consumer good price would have to be in the long run. And so, whether, like I said, whether they explicitly said it or not, it certainly led you to think along the lines that value starts in the factors of production and is somehow flows into the final consumer goods, whereas in the Mengarian framework, it was the opposite. The consumer goods were valuable subjectively because they had the capacity to satisfy people's wants, and that's why people directly valued the consumer goods. And then because the consumer goods had that value, then we realized, oh, so things that are scarce that help us make those consumer goods, those should uh, we should attribute value to those also. But in terms of specifically how on the margin do goods exchange against each other and according to which ratios and how, how does subjective value explain that? Menger really in his principles book only focused on consumer goods. So he pointed the way as to how you would explain the valuation of higher order factors of production, but he certainly did not spend time developing that. And that makes perfect sense. Menger was given this new theory and even by construction, the first thing you had to explain on the ground floor was the pricing of consumer goods and how are the, how does value get attributed to them? And so that's where Menger started and spent most of his time. And he wanted to come back and just never got around to it. And so Wieser and also Bambaver came in and thought, okay, we're going to explain this more fully now. Now, they tried different approaches, Bambaver and Wieser, to this problem of how do you explain the valuation and the market pricing of factors of production. So Bambavrik suggested what we might call a loss principle by saying that, well, the the uh, let's say the marginal utility, I'm going to use that phrase even though Bambavrik didn't originally, that was, remember, a phrase Wieser coined, said that um, it was this loss principle where if you took away one of the factors of production and then assessed what happens to the value of the finished consumer good, then that's how much value that particular factor of production should have. So the problem here is it can lead to, let's call it overcounting. So let me just give you a silly example, like the Beatles, the, the, the musical band, that the Beatles, all four of them together, they show up and put on a concert, and let's say that generates a million dollars in net income that the concert promoter is willing to pay to the, to the Beatles as a group. But then you say, okay, how do they divide that money up? How do they know how it should be split? Does it get, does it get split four ways? Each person gets 250000 And you might say, using Bambavrik's approach, well, to figure out how much Ringo should get, what would happen if Ringo, the drummer, didn't show up? Well, the fans would be pretty disappointed. The Beatles get up there and start singing songs without a drummer. That would be horrible. And so maybe instead of earning a million dollars, the concert promoter only earns 100000 because the fans are so disgusted they don't sell as many tickets, what have you, people demand refunds. So does that mean that Ringo should get $900,000? Well, probably not because by the same token, if John Lennon doesn't show up, you know, it's billed as, hey, the Beatles are going to be here, then John Lennon doesn't show up, the people are going to be pretty disappointed. Ironically, it might not be as bad if there's no drummer. You know, they could play songs that Paul's the lead singer on and maybe get by if, if Lennon's not there, but certainly it's going to be bad. And so the point is it's it's going to be worth more than a $100,000 hit there. And so just using those examples or this principle, you might end up concluding that, oh, yeah, Ringo's worth 900000 and John Lennon's worth 700000 and Paul McCartney's worth 700000 and George Harrison's worth 400000 and all of a sudden, you've 
added up way more than the million million dollars that you know the Beatles in total are worth. All right, so I'm speaking loosely here, but I'm just trying to motivate the uh, this issue, and so you can see the problems involved that we can use the Mangarian framework to explain the price of the concert, you know, and the total revenue that the concert generates and, and the net income by reference to the subjective valuations of the of the fans. But then to figure out, okay, how does that net income generated at the consumer level then get allocated among the different factors of production, it's a tricky concept. And so Bumbavark with this loss principle, that sounds sensible. It actually sounds similar to what we now use in terms of marginal productivity theory. But it's the when he tried to apply it, other economists said, oh, wait a minute, though, that, that's, you know, there's some problems here. It might lead to overcounting. Okay, so what Wieser is famous for is th what's called this imputation approach. And he also talked about opportunity costs, but he didn't use that phrase. That phrase was going to be coined later. And so this imputation approach, he was saying that what we're trying to do is take the value of the consumer goods that Menger has told us how they're valued in his book, and now we want to impute the value appropriately to the factors of production. So that's that's what this word means in this context of imputation. And the way he wanted to do it was just looking at the technical relationships. So for, he gives this example. Suppose there are three different factors of production. Let's call them X, Y, and Z. And any two of them can be combined in certain relationships certain you know physical quantities to yield three different types of consumer goods and we can uh, using Menger's approach we can say how much those consumer goods are worth and let's just give specific numbers using uh, Wieser's approach here so it's x plus y equals 100 right so one unit of factor x whatever it is maybe labor one unit of factor y maybe it's a acre of land Add, you know, combine those together. It's not like you're literally adding them up, but meaning um, the prices of those two things put together have to equal 100, let's call it dollars. All right, so the idea here is we know from Menger that the total value of the factors of production collectively that generate some consumer good has to equal the price of that consumer good. So if this consumer good sells for $100, and it takes one unit of X and one unit of Y, and that's it to make it, well, then the price of X plus the price of Y must be 100. That's the idea. But we don't know how that's distributed thus far. Right? Menger didn't give us enough to say, oh, X should be 90 and Y should be 10, or X should be 30 and Y should be 70. We don't know that yet. All we know is that the price of X plus the price of Y has to equal 100 because one unit of X physically combined with one unit of Y in a, in a technological process produces this consumer good that then sells for $100. That's the idea. So now that I've laboriously explained that first one, the other two happen to be 2x plus 3z equals 290, and 4y plus 5z equals 590. So again, these algebraic expressions or equations, they're, they're saying, they're shorthand for saying, for example, 2x plus 3z equals 290. What that Where that's coming from is Wieser saying, Suppose there is a physical technological process by which two units of X combined with three units of Z physically produces some good that we then sell for $290 to the ultimate consumer. So then, again, Menger's telling us it must therefore be that two times the price of X plus three times the price of Z equals $290, that we're getting that information from that. So now you see where he's going with this. In equilibrium, it must be true that those three equations are all satisfied simultaneously, and then it's just an algebra problem, and X must be $40, Y must be $60, and Z must be $70. All right, so at this point, let's just stop and say this is an odd way of proceeding methodologically. All right, this is not using individual microanalysis to, in the terms of human action to explain the price of certain goods.
In particular, this is not at all analogous to how Menger explained consumer good prices. All right, so it's it's um, odd to think, well, not odd, but it's not so clear that this really is the natural extension of the Mengerian approach. Because here, what you're doing is looking at a bunch of simultaneous equations. This is more of a Walrasian approach to figure out what equilibrium prices have to be. Another limitation to this approach is the way Wieser first did it, he had all of the coefficients being fixed, right? So that, oh, production process one, you take one unit of X and one unit of Y to make this thing that sells for 100, period. But in reality, it's not as if there's 30,000 different production processes in the economy and they all use exactly fixed ratios of various types of inputs or, or coefficients, if you want to say it that way, that in practice, even a given factory that's making some product like certain types of automobiles, if labor gets really expensive, they can substitute somewhat. They can hire fewer workers and bring in more capital equipment. You know, get, So we have fewer workers who are working with more machinery and tools to keep producing the same make and model automobile. And so just modeling the economy like this, that there's a bunch of fixed production processes is a bit unrealistic because actually in, in the real world, firms do have the ability to substitute somewhat among factors. They can't say, oh, let's get rid of labor altogether and just use land. That doesn't work. But on the margin, they are able to substitute and use some of some more of one, some types of inputs and use less of other types of inputs depending on prices and so forth. And so Wieser's approach, at least the way he first tackled this, didn't allow for that. Okay, so I don't want to leave you guys hanging. There was a lot more work on this problem of pricing the factors of production. So people like J.B. Clark, Philip Wicksteed, Wal Ross in the later editions of his book, uh, Alfred Marshall and Nut Vixell, they all developed what we now call marginal productivity theory when it comes to factor pricing. And you know this this is straightforward stuff that if you've taken in a standard economics class, you would have heard it already. But for example, how do we figure out in equilibrium what what's the wage rate that the workers earn in a competitive market? And you say, oh, well, it's ultimately they get paid their marginal product. So the firm figures out, okay, if I hire one more unit of labor, let's say you know I uh, one one more hour of labor of a certain quality, what happens to total output? So the, what does that mean then for total revenue? And how much did our total revenue go up? And assuming other inputs do, didn't change, our costs were the same, so that means our net income went up by that amount. And then that is the marginal revenue product of that last marginal hour of labor that we just hired. Because if I do hire that last marginal unit of labor, total net income to the firm goes up by, whatever, $8.00. So that means the marginal product of that last hour of labor is $8 with no taxes or any kind of distortions like that. The firm would be willing to pay up to $8 for that. And so if the firm's only paying 6 and then earning that $2 gap, that gives an incentive for some other firm to come in and offer six fifty, Or some other firm might say, oh, I'll give you 7 and so on. So they're saying in equilibrium, workers we believe would be paid wages that are equal to the marginal product of their labor. So in this approach, the thing you need to watch out for is what's called exhaustion of the product. And so you can write mathematical models of the economy and assume that all factors of production get paid their marginal product. So not just labor, but also the landowners. Just say, well, gee, in a competitive market, somebody who owns a bunch of uh, farmland, how much does he or she earn? He was a marginal marginal productivity theory. That you say this last acre right here, if it's brought into cultivation and the owner rents it out to sharecroppers or something, or you know, <laughs> other people come in, other operations come in and want to use the land for agricultural uh, purposes and just pay the landlord, how much can he charge and how much are they willing to pay? Well, again, it has to do with what happens to total output and total revenue if we bring in that last marginal acre of land into the operation. 
and then that's how much the owner of it can earn. So that's how all factors prices are determined according to marginal productivity theory. But again, there's this issue of suppose you think everyone's earning it that way. It's possible you can write out mathematical models of the economy where when you take the marginal productivity of each factor and then multiply by the total number of units of those factors being supplied and add it all up, it doesn't exhaust the full value of the product. And so it's like there's a gap left over that is not being allocated to the factors. And so that's kind of an issue. And I frankly think the way economists, or mathematical economists at least, solve this problem, and it's solve is like in quotation marks, is they just say, well, let's make sure we pick our production functions and whatever so that that doesn't happen. So we get some nice pretty result where every the total output is fully explained and allocated to all the factors of production. So we have this nice little self-contained system where everything works out nicely. So I actually don't think modern economists have really solved all the problems that people were throwing at Bumbavert, for example. And I think it's just more they're saying, well, this stuff seems to work out in the real world, and we can kind of write down stylized models where we can fully explain it using our principles and... It's not like things blow up in reality, so I think we're all right. But I don't think they've actually... Let me put it this way. Some of the arguments that people use to criticize Bumbavrik's approach, I think would also trip up a regular mainstream economist right now if you grabbed him or her and said, okay, how do you explain prices? And then, well, what about this? What about the Beatles, for example? You know, so there it's... it's um, I guess you what you would say is it's not saying if Ringo leaves and you don't get to replace them. The question is, if Ringo leaves and they're allowed to hire some other drummer, that's that's more, uh, that's more a better way of thinking about what is the actual contribution of Ringo Starr to the Beatles. That, you know, just... Because otherwise, if you think about it, it'd be, it'd be absurd, depending on how you apply it. And I'm not saying Bombavrik was this naive by any stretch, but just how you apply those those ideas... You could say, oh, well, the kid whose job it is to plug in all the equipment or to make sure the lights are on, he, he's worth a lot, too, because if the Beatles are playing in the dark, people wouldn't like that. I mean, you realize, well, no, but the kid whose job it is to turn the lights on in the in the stadium or something, he, he's completely replaceable. He's not that important, whereas if Paul McCartney's sick, you can't just say, oh, quick, somebody else fill in for Paul. That's not going to work. Another point that... um. I, th- I think uh, it was Schumpeter that stressed this in his history of economic thought on this issue is that he said, notice that when we, um, once we can figure out the factor prices, now we know the income distribution among the entire classes of factors as the classicals studied. So people like David Ricardo, they worried about how much of the total output was going to go to the landowners and how much of the total output was going to go to the workers as a class and how much was going to go to the capitalists. And we, now, if we're instead explaining, okay, what what's the individual price of an acre of land? How much is that, how much annual rent does that earn? And so forth. Well, now that we have those fundamental building blocks, we have a lot more information at our disposal and we can still compute those broad aggregates that the classical economists focused on in their models. So if you know what individual rate wage rates are and you know how many workers are supplying how many total hours of labor, it's just a multiplication problem then to say how much is labor as a whole earning. One thing I want to point out here is I've just noticed it when I was reading the different commentaries on this period and this uh, this topic from different historians of economic thought, for some reason, several of them were just biting the head off of J.B. Clark because he helped develop this marginal productivity theory approach to explaining factor prices. But then he went further and offered the opinion that this is ethical, right? To say, hey, it's a good thing or it's fair that in a market economy, each productive factor is paid in accordance with its contribution to the final output. He thought, yeah, I mean, he thought as a, as a positive economist, this is how it works. And then from a normative perspective, he thought, and that seems pretty fair, right? And for some reason, people were biting his head off 
saying, oh, no, that's, you know, he's trying to justify the outcome of laissez-faire distribution of income, and, and that's a completely illegitimate leap. That, yes, we can say as positive scientists, this is how things operate on, a, on an unfettered market, but J.B. Clark is way out of line for then extrapolating and saying, and this is a good thing. But these same historians of economic thought, I, w- I went and looked at their treatment of, of Marx, who thought that workers were entitled to the full value of their product, and nobody bit Mark's head off and said, whoa, where's he coming up with that crazy notion? Why would you ever think that a worker ought to be paid the full value of what he contributed to the output? But in that context, everybody believes that, right? That's obvious. Like That's supposed to be the horrors of the capitalist system is that Marx taught the workers didn't get paid the full value of their product. So if, if you believe it there, it's... I don't see why you wouldn't say, okay, so if I own land and the land contributes a certain amount to the value of the product, why isn't the landlord entitled to the full value of the product? Now, you might say, well, because he's not actually doing it, it's the land doing it. Okay, so the land then is entitled, but the land's not a human, so why wouldn't it be the owner of the land? And if you say, well, that's not fair, well, it it sounds like what you're challenging is the ownership, but given that you think it's correct to say this person here owns this land, why is that so crazy to say, and therefore he should re- he should reap the full value of the land's contribution to the product? So anyway, that's just my observation that people were biting off J.B. Clark's head, but they had no problem, at least when it came to labor, getting paid the full value of its product. It's weird. It's almost like they wanted labor to get paid more than the full value of its product. Because if you don't, if you agree that the you don't have this issue of the exhaustion of the product going on, and so that under laissez-faire, just straightforward market productivity principles, each factor gets paid its marginal product, and then if you want some rich people to not get paid that full amount, so that others can get paid more, then necessarily you're saying you want those other factors to get paid more than the value of their product, which is kind of weird. Okay, let's spend just a few more minutes here now talking about Wieser's book, Natural Value. So here, he was arguing that economic value was like a natural concept or category. So that's the the reason for the title of natural value that existed outside of the institutional framework. So what he meant was, you know, there's underlying natural concepts involved or categories of value and price and so on that it's not determined so much by property titles and, and the, just the way the legal system is set up and so forth, that we as economists can an, analyze something much more fundamental. I don't know that he would use this analogy, but maybe just to, to motivate the concepts, perhaps it's useful to think of it like this. You could study the laws of physics, and that's true whether the government is committed to laissez-faire or is heavily interventionist or is an outright socialist state. Right, like the conservation of energy or something like that, or measuring momentum, those things are true, and the principles we use to determine them are true irrespective of government policy. And so I think what Wieser was trying to get across with this notion of natural value was that we as economists can study these principles, and they're not dependent on the institutional framework. Now, what's interesting, you might say, okay, yeah, I like that. He's kind of sort of upholding the validity of economic law as such and, and trying to limit the hands of the government. And that is one way of thinking about it. But the way he took it, perhaps ironically from your perspective, was to show that a socialist government actually could rationally order an economy so long as it did so according to these more fundamental principles. All right, so he he wasn't using this as a way to say that's why we uh, shouldn't have intervention because you know politicians should not meddle with these underlying natural laws of how the economy works, which is the way somebody like uh, Rothbard might take it or Bastiat, for example. Wieser instead said, yeah, there's these principles that are true irrespective of institutional framework, and so the people designing these institutions or running them tweaking them, just need to make sure they take these principles into account. So the irony, again, here is that when Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich Hayek 
later in the 20s and 30s would be arguing with the market socialists, and of course we're going to talk about this later, uh, arguably you could say that they were battling the legacy that had been um, put in place by one of Menger's star pupils. So that's just that's kind of ironic. Okay, that's the end of our lecture for today on Viser, and I will see you guys next time.